For our Experts in Emotion interview, we'll be speaking with Dr. David Watson on personality and emotion. Dr. Watson is the Andrew McKenna Family Professor of Psychology at the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Watson is a personality psychologist with particular expertise in personality assessment. His work investigates the structure and measurement of personality, mood, and psychopathology, as well as examining how personality traits relate to clinical disorders. He works in a variety of substantive areas within psychopathology, including depression and the anxiety disorders, personality disorders, schizotypy, and the sleep and dissociative disorders. The long-term goal of his work is to develop comprehensive taxonomic models that integrate normal range and pathological processes into a single overarching scheme. Dr. Watson has published more than 100 articles in the top journals in psychology, including the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, the Journal of Abnormal Psychology, Psychological Bulletin, and Psychological Assessment, and he currently serves as Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Abnormal Psychology. So I now turn to a very special Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. David Watson on personality and emotion. So I want to thank you for speaking with us today, David. Welcome. Oh, I'm happy to do so. Thanks okay. for having me. Fantastic. So one of the questions I wanted to start asking you was really where this all began for you. So what first sparked your interest and got you, you know, started in studying processes of emotion? Uh, well, I don't know if my answer is typical or atypical, uh, but it was completely serendipitous. So uh, the backstory is my future wife got a Fulbright Fellowship to study in Japan. Uh, and I wanted to go with her, so I was talking to Al Katelgan, who was my graduate advisor, uh, and he said, well, if you're going to Japan, why don't you do a mood study over in Japan? And I said, okay, and that became my dissertation. So uh, as part of this, I started reading up on the mood literature, which was actually pretty small uh, back then, and I really, you know, I fell in love with it. But I can't say before that I had the slightest interest in it. Hmm. I, I never would have anticipated going into it. So it's one of those serendipitous discoveries into the world of emotion. Yeah, and, and you know, the world was very different back then. Uh, there was not much of an emotional literature. Uh, the mood literature was quite small. I really mastered it, I would say, in a week. Hmm. Um, it, was, it was not, it was not a, the golden age of emotion research back then. Do you know what sort of kept your attention going in, in the world of emotion and mood once you got hooked? Well, the thing I liked about it was that it was so pliable. I mean, you could, uh, you know, you could study biological processes, you could study you know, facial expressions, you could study situational factors. So in some of our early work, we looked at exercise, social activity, caffeine, uh, weather variables. Uh, it had obvious connections to psychopathology, and then, you know, finally, of course, it was related to personality. So, you know, I, I think it was, uh, it was really an expansive topic, which you could take in a lot of different directions rather than being restrictive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then it seemed like it was completely wide open. I mean, you, you know, there was so little research that was done uh, that almost anything you did uh, was innovative. Mm, that's so interesting. So, I mean, since then, you've done just a wide number of innovative things, and I actually had trouble finding just, you know, one small cluster of questions I could ask you about because there's just so many things one could talk with you about. Um, but one of the things I thought I might start by asking you about is just about your work. Um, so you're widely known for your influential work on the development and assessment of personality. And I wondered how you think research on affect and emotion can improve our understanding of variation in personality traits. Well, I, th I think in a, in a couple of ways. So first of all, uh, when people started doing research on affect and emotion, uh, I think the conventional wisdom was that most personality did not have much to do with emotion. I think going back to Isaac, most people thought that neuroticism was about negative emotion. Uh, but if you read about traits such as conscientiousness and extroversion, um, the, the focus was on cognitive, behavioral processes, social processes, not emotional processes. So I, I think the emotion research has fundamentally changed the way that we, we view these traits. I think with, in, in terms of uh, the major traits of personality, maybe something like intellect or openness, doesn't have a strong emotional component, but pretty much everything else does. 
Uh, and so I, and I think this, is, this has really changed the way that we view personality traits. Uh, when I started in, in the field in the 1970s, the field was primarily descriptive. Um, and now uh, I think linking personality to emotion research has also clarified the biological bases for these things. I mean, you know, uh, the inhibition system, the approach system, and how they're related to traits like neuroticism and extroversion. Uh, I think the next generation of research is going to be to try to understand uh, the particular emotional signatures of different traits. So uh, I think one of the challenges we're working on in my lab right now uh, is conscientiousness as a personality trait has surprisingly strong connections to depression and the anxiety disorders. And I suspect a lot of that, again, is emotion-based, but we really don't understand that very well right now. How do you think we might use some of this information to better inform our clinical assessment of personality disorders? Well, personality disorders, uh, I think, offer some interesting challenges. Um, particularly in the assessment of positive emotions, I, I think, because uh, you have disorders uh, such as avoidant personality disorder, uh, borderline, that seem to be associated with deficits in positive emotionality. But then there's good evidence that uh, there are disorders such as narcissistic yeah. a personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder that are associated with elevated positive mood. And in fact, when you start looking at uh, specific aspects of personality disorders, um, many uh, aspects that are related to positive emotionality and extroversion actually can go both ways. So you have uh, people who are dependent, overly dependent on others, uh, who uh, are, are, have, are, are more almost clingy and dependent on other people, uh, that are afraid of being abandoned, and then you have people who are extremely aloof um, and are cold and indifferent to other people. So I think that dimension in particular has a, a lot of potential for differentiating different types of clinical conditions and, you know, and trying to figure out you know, why, why we see such wide ranges in behavior. That's fascinating. I mean, one of the other things about your work that I found particularly exciting is that you've also scientifically demonstrated how we can use measures of positive and negative affect to differentiate among, you know, anxiety and mood disorders um, in ways that we just didn't understand previously. And I wondered if you could just say a bit more about what you found to be some of the most important or exciting discoveries here. Well, probably our first major discovery was in the area of depression, uh, which, which seems to be, we've now looked at a wide range of disorders, not everything, but a wide range of disorders, and, and depression seems to be associated with a particularly strong deficit in positive emotionality. And in extreme cases, it seems to be a, an inability to experience normal levels of positive emotion. Uh, and this really differentiates uh, depression uh, from some other disorders, even uh, disorders such as generalized anxiety disorder, which is strongly comorbid with it and strongly related to it. Uh, and I think one of the things that's striking from some of our recent symptom work is that uh, positive emotionality is actually a better, more specific symptom of depression, even though it's not part of the formal symptom criteria for depression, than many of the current depression symptoms are. So, for example, insomnia tends to be a more nonspecific uh, symptom, which is pervasive in clinical populations. Uh, so it's an interesting system, a symptom, but it doesn't really differentiate uh, depression from other disorders. So I, you know, I've been writing about this in recent years. I think the implication is that we need to be building uh, positive emotionality criteria into more clinical syndromes. I think that would, really would improve diagnosis and assessment. And I wanted to ask you a bit about that. So in what ways do you think we can leverage this information, especially related to positive affect, as you just pointed out in the case of depression, um, to aid in, you know, differential diagnosis or developing and refining treatment interventions that are really focused on these, you know, affect-related symptoms? Yeah, well, you know, ha having studied uh, diagnosis and assessment for a number of years, in, in some ways it's impressive, but I, I think there, that 
uh, clinical assessment is biased uh, toward, uh, in assessment terms, toward convergent validity, or if you prefer to posit toward positive symptoms. So I think uh, clinicians have been very adept at identifying uh, problems that patients complain about. Um, you know, so they can't sleep, they're having trouble eating, they're unhappy. Uh, but I think they've underrepresented deficits, so things that should be there but aren't. And quite often, uh, positive, positive emotional sim symptoms are related to that. So when we don't, we don't see normal levels of happiness, we don't see normal levels of engagement, those types of symptoms seem to be underrepresented. Uh, and I think that uh, clinicians and diagnostic criteria tend to underrepresent uh, more specific symptoms. So I, quite often, they overweight uh, problems and symptoms that are common to all kinds of conditions. Um, and so again, I think that's why po uh, the positive system is particularly interesting because you see large deficits in some disorders, uh, few deficits in many disorders, and then you see elevations in positive ones, so like excessive approach behavior, overconfidence uh, in other conditions. Well, this relates to the last question I wanted to ask you about your work. Um, so as you're saying, a lot of your recent work has fo focused on the assessment of positive emotionality using the IDAS-2 scale and how it relates both to personality on the one hand and psychopathology on the other hand. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the specificity of positive emotion dysfunction that you've been showing in your work, especially since this is really a relatively new field to begin to sort of unearth in the realm of both, you know, emotion, just studying positive emotion more generally and applying it clinically. We know almost nothing about positive emotion and how it tells us about unique features of different psychological disorders. Yeah, so that's another serendipitous finding. I, I kind of got dragged into the assessment of uh, excessive positive emotionality, particularly in the context of uh, bipolar symptoms and bipolar disorder. Uh, it does. I, w I would not. I would not say it's completely specific to bipolar disorder. There seem to be uh, similar elevations in narcissism, for example. Uh, but the specificity is is really remarkable. Um, we're still struggling to understand that because, in some cases, we have measures, we've developed symptom measures that seem to be similar. Uh, empirically, they're correlated with each other, uh, and yet one measure shows deficits in depression, another one shows elevations in mania. So what exactly differentiates the two from, from each other? Uh, you know, we, we've developed some hypotheses, we're getting some data. It seems that uh, in uh, disorders that are associated with elevated positive moods seem to be associated with excessive activation, uh, with overconfidence that leads to impulsivity and recklessness. Um, but I think we have a long way to go to figure out exactly what differentiates that, you know, from more normal adaptive forms of positive affect. And that's what I was going to ask you. Do you think there's any glimmers of ways in which we can use this scale, the IDAS-2, to try to tease apart, you know, more maladaptive from adaptive variations of normal positive mood? Are there ways that we can look forward to try to make those really difficult distinctions? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, right now we're, we're stymied to some extent by limitations in our thinking and in our assessment approach. So again, we, you know, we didn't necessarily expect these things. So uh, what, one of the things we're trying to do now is, is to understand um, the specific type of positive mood that's, that's uh, elevated in, um, for example, bipolar disorder. Uh, in general, one of the problems that you face in studying positive mood is going back to Darwin, uh, you know, there are well-developed classification sy systems for negative mood. I mean, if you were to ask emotion theorists, everyone would recognize anger, they would recognize fear, they would recognize disgust. But when you get into positive emotions, we don't really have a good taxonomy, a good classification system. Uh, people talk about amusement, joy, interest, curiosity, uh, energy, vigor. I mean, um, what are the basic positive emotional states and how they differ from each other? And I think that's going to be part of the next generation is to figure out you know, what's going on there. So thinking ahead then about the next generation, where do you see the future of emotion, emotion research headed at this point? 
Well, speaking for myself, I, I think what we're seeing increasingly, and, and uh, I, I, I think this is going to be the wave of the future, uh, is just complete integration. So I'm asked to write a number of you know, chapters and papers on personality and emotion, personality and psychopathology. Uh, but I think we're reaching the point where you can't do this X and Y kind of thing, that they're all part of the same systems. So what, when, we, when I think of psychopathology, I think primarily in terms of emotional dysfunction. That's not all of it, but that's a lot of it. When I think of personality, I think of variations in emotional processes. When I study affect and emotion, there's obviously a very strong dispositional component to it. Um, and, I, you know, integrating these things, particularly in a biological context, uh, is going to be uh, crucial. Uh, funding now through NIMH, uh, their RDOC um, system, I think is an explicit recognition of this. Uh, so, there, you know, uh, NIMH is moving away from uh, DSM diagnostic categories and more in terms of these underlying bio-emotional behavioral systems. So I think integration, full integration, is the next step. And a lot of the next step, of course, involves not just current researchers in the field, but also students who are training to become the next generation. And so when students, your own or others, come to you and ask for advice, sort of where, where should they you know, be putting their time and energy, or what should they be focusing on? What kind of advice do you have for students just embarking in the study of emotion? And I'm not sure I'm very good at giving advice. Um, my advice is to, uh, is, to, is to find whatever is interesting to you uh, and pursue that. Uh, I think my, my career is somewhat different from many of my contemporaries in that I really resisted doing one type of thing. Um, I started out primarily as a mood researcher. I did some clinical research. I did some personality research. Uh, within the clinical world, I study probably a wider range of disorders than just about anybody. Um, but I, I follow, you know, I try to solve problems uh, that interest me. And uh, one of the, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of revisiting uh, areas and, and issues and realizing that I was stymied at some point, that I couldn't figure out an answer to something. And that motivates me to continue on it. And um, I, at times I resist this. I say I can't solve this problem, but eventually I go back to it. And why can't I solve this problem? You know, why are things the way they are? That's about all the advice I can give. That's really good advice. Thank you so much um, for the advice. And thank you so much for speaking with us today, David. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks again for having me. This concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. David Watson.